welcome to the Doofcast, a film and TV podcast from Doof Media. My name is Scott Daly, and I am your host, and I'm joined, of course, as always, by my legal counsel. I've forgotten his name, so so we'll just call him the counselor. Uh, How's it going today, counselor? No, it's I'm, I'm doing great, Scott. Um, and I'm, of course, here um, for some reason. It's like a it's like a business deal. I'm, I'm unclear on the details, and it doesn't really matter particularly. <laughs> oh, boy. I can't wait to talk to you about this movie. Uh, this week on the show, we are back with Ridley Scott taking a look at the director's 21st film titled The Counselor. Um, oh, boy. It's, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be a great conversation, Matt. It's going to be one of those ones that uh, it's, it's going to be a, a blast to listen to, I think. I I hope so. Yes. <laughs> uh, also, after we finish our conversation about the counselor, we are going to be talking. Uh, we're, we're airing a new segment on the show this week. It's called Nobody Knows What They're Doing. Uh-huh. And this week on Nobody Knows What They're Doing, we're going to be talking about Glass Onion, the newest Knives Out movie, and Strange World, the newest Disney animated feature film that came out last weekend, uh, which might be a shock to some of you. And <laughs> yeah. and that'll be part of what we're talking about. Yep. Uh, all right, Matt, let's get into it. Let's talk all about Ridley Scott's The Counselor. I intend to love you until I die. Me first. Counselor. My back's against the wall, man. Money problems are serious problems. I will set it up. 625 kilos. We're probably looking at 20 million. I know why I'm in it. Do you? It's a nice ring. Want to know how much it's worth? I always thought a law degree was a license to steal, but you hadn't really capitalized on it. I'm really worried, baby. It's gonna be all right. If you pursue this road that you've embarked upon, you will eventually come to moral decisions that will take you completely by surprise. You should be careful what you wish for. You might not get it. Matt, what is this movie all about? A lawyer finds himself in over his head when he gets involved in drug trafficking. This movie was written by Cormac McCarthy himself. It was, of course, directed by Ridley Scott. and stars Michael Fassbender, Penelope Cruz, Cameron Diaz, and Javier Bardem. Uh, a, a, a murderer's row of casting there. Um, mm-hmm. Matt, I, I'm, getting, I'm getting the feeling, just uh-huh. by the overall tenor of the conversation so far, that you did not care much for this particular film so I, tell me what, what so, do you think of the counselor so we've sort of avoided talking about it um on purpose <laughs> between ourselves uh-huh the 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 truth is closer to i have such complicated feelings about this movie and i think it's going to be a fun conversation in part because i have no idea what to do with it um i, I think i think one of the only things i i texted you about this movie like in the middle of watching it i just texted you scott this movie <laughs> um so so here here's I, I i'm still working my way through things here but I, here, here's where i'll start is to say um it seems evident from watching this movie that cormac mccarthy has never seen a movie <laughs> um and and certainly never written any other sort of uh work of fiction for screen or stage yeah you, you know you know those those screenplay books that you know budding screenwriters go out and buy that like give you the basic rules of a screenplay mm-hmm. how to write how to stage scenes how people talk in real life Nah, he didn't he didn't get any of that stuff and and apparently this is factual that the, the entire screenplay was basically dialogue um which is interesting, an interesting piece of information because it mean it, it it sort of implies that a huge amount of what we're seeing on the screen must have been sort of fixed up by Ridley Scott at all. Um, yeah, I mean, there's this really complicated thing that goes on in screenplays where, based on who wrote what, um, how much how much stage direction, how much information about the scene is in the writing itself, and how much the the production crew has to kind of come up with. And yeah, I, I read that about this too, that this was almost entirely just dialogue scenes. And so it does put a lot on Ridley. Yeah. And there there are things people say um, in this movie that are so hilariously overwrought and, and purple <laughs> that I just couldn't help but laugh and m- maybe 
75% jokingly was like, I think we need to take away McCormick McCarthy's genius status because of this movie. <laughs> because he wrote this dialogue and he thought this was like really just great dialogue. And it's like even these great actors just can't do it. It doesn't work. Um, it, it is quite remarkable that that we have this this great list of actors. Another name that I didn't read in there is Brad Pitt, who's in this uh-huh. movie as well, who, yeah. who is a phenomenal actor. Michael Fassbender, phenomenal actor. Penelope Cruz, Oscar-winning actress. Javier Bardem, I think he won an Oscar as well. Um, and Cameron Diaz is very good as well. And you're so right that none of them seem to be up to the challenge of like, how how Ridley, how do I say this line uh-huh. in a way that people say it? And the the direction had to have been like, well, nobody talks like this, so you don't. And so they're just trying. And, okay, so Matt, <laughs> can I can I tell you a quick story about uh-huh. this movie? Um, so we meant to record this episode two weeks ago, uh, and then you got sick, and then I got sick, and then which, by the way, we really need to sync our illnesses. This is getting really inconvenient. I, I agree. Yeah, but um. So I watched it in preparation for that recording date, and I hated it. In the first forty-five minutes, I was basically messaging you, being like, "What? What the fuck? What the fuck?" I, I I had seen this movie before; it had been a while. I didn't remember liking it, but it was it was uh, it's confounding me what was happening in this movie, or or maybe not happening. And then the sa- second half of the movie, I started getting I started getting into it a little bit. I was mm-hmm. starting to like it a little bit. I was start. I, I got on the movie's wavelength and I was enjoying myself. And then I had to sit with the movie for two weeks because we didn't end up recording and talking about it. And so mm-hmm. I, I was turning it over in my head, both because I knew I had to keep it in there because I knew we were still going to have to talk about it. And also because the movie was just turning itself over in my head. And I actually ended up rewatching it today in preparation for the show. And I got to tell you, man, I love this movie. <laughs> <laughs> I really do. Uh-huh. I, like, l- let me let me preface this with: I don't think this is a good movie. I, uh-huh. I think it fails on some of the fundamentals of storytelling and of of movies, of motion pictures. But there's something about it that is just incredibly alluring to me, and I really want to spend a lot of time kind of breaking that down with you because I I, I think functionally it just doesn't work, but. I I I love it. I really yeah. do. I can't believe it. I did not expect this. It's it's interesting. Um, I, I really don't hate it, but it is a really really weird movie, and it, I think it does have what I would call flaws, mm-hmm. um, mainly in the dialogue, but also in the plot structure. But but that's setting that aside. Um, okay. Okay, I think I think here's here's what I want to say is like in the alternate universe where Cormac McCarthy wrote this as a novel and then someone who understood how to write screenplays <laughs> turned it into a screenplay with a more conducive structure and toned down the dialogue a bit and then Ridley Scott directed that this would be regarded as an all-time great. Like this would be a beloved film on par with, if not possibly exceeding No Country for Old Men. Um, but that's not what happened. <laughs> I, I, the, the thing is, I think you're so right. <laughs> I, I think you're totally right about this. It's it's a very ev- um, evocative... Uh, uh, the, the, the story, the things that happen in the movie really grab you. Like, I, mm-hmm. I get why this has stuck with you for two weeks, because it stuck with me for two weeks as well, because it's got these incredibly vivid kind of horrible or or shocking or baffling um moments or or images and um and it's just so like nihilistic and horrible that it just sits with you and i mean it's like when i read the road like the roads the, the road in some sense is still with me right like that yeah. that's what that's kind of what he does is he he writes in in a way that is going to like lodge a splinter deep in your brain for the rest of your life because he's, he's addressing these situations and choices that characters have to make that are just, um, it's kind of like the, um, the idea of Sophie's choice. How like, like once you hear about the idea of Sophie's choice, you're like, Oh my God, that's, 
that's so horrible and that, yeah. that idea kind of sticks with you. It's, mm-hmm. it's almost like he's trying to find things like that to just <laughs> sprinkle throughout his stories so that yeah. they're just kind of not, 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 not explicitly like that, but, but the sort of thing that stays with you. Um, you, you I think you know what I mean. Yeah. yeah, no, I, I think I know exactly what you mean. And yeah, I mean, that, that's, that's the thing about this movie is it, it, it there's almost these two tracks running alongside each other and Ridley is cutting back and forth between them. There's the actual drug deal, everything that's going on, which, which the movie kind of sets up very ambiguously. This is not a movie. It's fascinating because this is simultaneously a movie that tells you exactly what it is about. That tells you exactly what the themes are. That tells you exactly what we're doing with it while being kind of intentionally abstract and obtuse about the details of the actual plot movements Mm -hmm. like like the details of what is going on with this 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 the drug deal itself and who is involved and how are they involved and what are they doing for it and and how is all going down a lot of this just plays out for you without any real explanation we enter the movie you know while the deal is already happening so we don't actually see what anyone any one of our characters is actually doing as part of it. And and I, I think it's really fascinating the way the movie really gets into the details of everything that's going on with this sewage truck full of, of uh, cocaine and also uh, a body as we'll see later. Um, and, and like we spend so much time on like the, the minute mundane details of, of the, the transfer across the United States, the attempted hijacking of the car, uh, the, the way the cartel foils that hijacking. Like one of the details that I just can't get over is this is a movie that takes time to show the cartel guy has killed the two people that stole the truck. Um, he's limping and it takes time to not only show him take out a, like a stick and carve the stick to plug up the hole in the leaking sewage that was shot by a bullet hole. But then we take him to a place um, where he has the door with the bullet holes exchanged. And we like see a man carefully solder (laughs) the hole in the truck shut, right? This is Mm -hmm. something that the movie takes time to do this, which with the deal itself is an abstraction that is just motivating what is happening with our main characters. And yet, and yet we take the time to live in this thing in particular. And I, I find that fascinating. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I agree. We spend a lot of time following the, the machinations of, of the drug, of, of the progress of, of the truck. You know, there was, there was one thing that I was expecting to happen that I don't think did happen, which was that like the bullet penetrated the cocaine inside the truck. And so it was it would be full of sewage. I was like expecting that to happen as like the final nihilistic twist of the night. <laughs> um, but it, I, 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 unless I like missed something, I don't think that actually did. Happen. No, that did not happen. Um, no. I think the thing, I don't know what they're doing. I don't know what we're doing with, with that. Like, I don't know why, why this choice other than the fact that the movie would feel even more weird if it was just following Fassbender around. Cause, <laughs> cause like, cause like, I don't really know like what his, what did he do like the, he put in some money toward something yeah but, but but why does the cartel need his money and like what is what what, yeah. what role does brad pitt have in things and what role does javier Bardem have in these and, and the, the thing is like the movie is i already know the answer is it doesn't matter the, the point is that that these characters have made a faustian bargain and and that they're now going to be punished for their 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 greed um yeah the details I, really don't matter. Yeah, I, and I love that choice. I actually do. Like, I think it, it makes it it makes it difficult to parse the first time you're watching the movie for sure. But I love that we don't know. Like, I, I guess we can assume that Javier Bardem's character is the one actually selling or or like the middleman to the distributors who are actually selling the drugs. But I agree. What? Fassbender's role in this is completely unknown. Why he's in this situation is completely unknown too, right? Where we're told kind of vaguely that he has some severe money problems and he's doing this because he has money problems. But we don't know with who. We don't know um 
you know, the, any of the details of that. We know we, he bumps into a former client of his who's very aggressive and combative with him. Maybe that's part of it. We, we don't know. Um, or maybe it's just good old fashioned greed. Maybe it's just he wants he has this woman that he's obsessed with that he's in love with and he wants to provide her the best possible of all things. Like he flies to Amsterdam to pick out a diamond ring for her, which yeah. just seems absolutely insane. So maybe, maybe that's it. Maybe it's just a, a problem of just literally his own making dealing with, with this woman he's in love with yeah. played by Penelope Cruz, but we don't know. We don't. And the movie is not interested in telling us any of that. So what the movie is interested in, I, I you know, I think it's, when I first watched it <clears throat> and thought about it, I was like, this movie's saying too many things. Um, but I think it's saying one thing upstream of all the other things that it's saying. And, and that is having to do with basically sex. Yes. And more specifically, like what men will do for women that they mm -hmm. are I obsessed with, which is a theme that basically is the undoing of all of our characters. Yep. Every single one of them in different ways. Uh, with different women and you know it, it's interesting because you could you could i've even seen it said that like one of the themes of the film is greed and, I, and i'm actually like i don't i don't really see fassbender as being motivated by greed i see him being mo motivated by um wanting to like woo his his lover in, in a in a way that she will find alluring so that he can he can marry her and 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 have her um yeah and oh god the the relationship with penelope cruz is so interesting mm -hmm. because i'm not saying i'm not doubting that he loves this woman but it seems so primarily driven by sex itself i mm -hmm. mean this, this 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 is a movie that makes a pretty loud statement in the first five minutes right we open the movie opens on michael fassbender and penelope cruz under the sheets doing it talking dirty and then getting down and it's a very you know no nudity but like it's a very explicit scene uh -huh. um where the movie is kind of laying its cards on the table for us there and every conversation that he has with this woman pretty much in the movie is driven around sex there's that whole <laughs> again a, a fantastic choice i don't know if it's a scripting choice or a directing choice but to have him doing phone sex and the movie doesn't let us hear her half of it <laughs> so it's just him talking uh -huh. and that's all we hear and it's it's absurd it's ridiculous and and yet i i love it because yeah. i think it shows how how like this is all about him and it's about his desire and want for her and yeah. what he's going to do to get it right well and and also she dies because of this yep. because of yep. like, like she dies directly because of his his overzealous attempt to, uh, you know, go out and, and become a master of the universe so that he can conquer her. Mm -hmm. It's, it's so delightfully perverse actually. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, yeah, the, and th there's, there's so much of this kind of thing throughout the movie. I mean, uh, uh, Cameron Diaz's character is, is like a different angle on this whole thing where it, it's almost like she's, she's a woman who has seen it all and she, as as naive as Penelope Cruz is, Cameron Diaz is worldly and is and understands exactly the way men are and and how they can be led by the nose and manipulated. Yeah. Um. And she does this very coldly and calculatedly. Um. Yeah. I mean, she's she's a predator and she's been invited into into his den. I mean, the the, the cheetah imagery is, I think, perfect here, right? Mm -hmm. Not only. Do they, do they have two tamed cheetahs that hang around the house? But she's got this <laughs> this incredible body length cheetah tattoo that goes from her shoulder all the way down. Her, yeah, God, I, everything. This is why I love this movie. But stuff like stuff choices like that. But yeah, that she is she is a predator, and he is kind of too uh, distracted, or you know, perhaps sees her only as as an object of desire, an object of sex, to see her as a a person that is an absolute threat like the like she says outright to him when they take an axe to the door i'll already be gone which is like i don't give a shit about you yeah as soon as it becomes unsafe for me here i'm out yeah um and of well, course is also secretly behind the scenes the one that causes all these problems to begin with and he yeah. knows it and yet he won't do anything about it because the, he's obsessed yeah. that, that 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 was the most yeah i i agree i agree totally that he he actually probably 
knows that she has him completely within her power and he's he's almost like fine with it or or it, it's, it's i think i guess it's just a statement about how power you know how powerless men are under the the sway mm-hmm. of women i guess is kind kind of the idea here i mean he says things throughout the movie where he's like yeah she she knows exactly what she's doing basically mm-hmm. like the um I just have to mention the weirdest scene ever. <laughs> when she fucks the car. When she fucks the car and he's <laughs> and he's watching and and this and 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 it's it's great because it's like, you know, I don't remember exactly the the interplay, but Fastbender is like, did she think this would be like sexually, you know, like erotic for you? And and he's basically like, No, I don't think she did. I think she knew she was just messing with my head. And, and, but like that, that to him is actually just like even more compelling because yeah. it's like, she's so in control of, she's basically, she basically can do whatever she wants with me. And, mm-hmm. and, and that's, yeah, I, it's fascinating, right? It's so, um, um, like layered and it doesn't really provide you with the answers. You And so you're just left trying to figure it out. Like, yeah. And then, and then of course uh, the Brad Pitt character who, you know, directly tells Fassbender that like, you know, I would quit this life. I'd go join the monastery and wash stairs for the rest of my life. But, but I just can't help myself. The women, and we uh-huh. see that play out later in the movie, where um, he is literally on the run from the cartel, is hiding out in London, and the first thing he does is see a hot blonde woman and and uh, get drinks with her and sleep with her, and then of course she's the one that that gets his information over to Cameron Diaz. Um, yeah, played by uh, what is her name? The check from game of thrones yeah the um uh the uh you know the tyrell chick basically mm-hmm. yeah I, I don't know her name but uh i think this is like one of the earliest things she's been in um uh, okay. i was yeah, surprised to see her i was like oh wow yeah she looked younger than she looks in game of thrones yeah. natalie dormer is her name yeah. yeah yeah that was that was an interesting you know it, it, it's interesting what scenes we get and what scenes we don't get right like there's a mm-hmm. whole scene where it's it's her and cameron diaz talking after after Tyrell woman has stolen um <laughs> has like stolen his personal information and she's like really upset to learn that Cameron Diaz is almost certainly going to murder this guy because that wasn't her intention like she's uh-huh. not a she she was just doing a job she didn't know that the guy was going to be killed and Cameron Diaz is just so cold about it and it's just interesting to watch that interplay because you know, for a movie that you could sort of accuse of being somewhat sexist for its kind of like focus on these male characters, Cameron Diaz is the one with all the power. And yeah. and, and and we get a scene like that where, where we actually really show the comp the complexity and and the dynamic of those two characters there. Um yeah. And and it's not a movie that like the conclusion of is like women are scary and bad, right? Like mm-hmm. it is it is it is all about the men. This is about what the men do. And it, yes, Cameron Diaz's character is technically the villain of the story, sure, but she's the only one. And none of the other women in this thing are are doing anything. Um, but just just the men around them are acting ridiculous because of them. It, it reminds me of the duelists in that way a lot. Mm-hmm. You know, like it's going way back to Ridley Scott's beginning of like, look at these dumbass dudes. <laughs> yeah. No idea what they're doing. That are in over their head. That are like i i loved the the conversation that the cartel guy has with fassbender about the world the worlds he's living in right like you've you've the world that you want to live in and the world that you're actually living in and this idea of you know like there's nothing you can do here like you you, you're just convinced of your own kind of superiority and ability to solve these problems and it's like no you are actually completely powerless and and it was that you're convincing of your own power that that got you into this yeah yeah i actually really love the scene i mean i love that scene you're describing i also love the scene prior to that where basically where brad pitt first comes to him and tells him um you know basically the the uh the drugs have been stolen and the cartel is suspicious of you. And that means we're all dead. Mm -hmm. And Fassbender's like, Oh oh, crap, this is no, this is really bad. What are we going to do? And, and Brad Pitt's like, there's nothing to do. I told you, (laughs) yeah, I told you that this was a horribly, horribly risky venture. And I told you not to, 
I actually, I actually told you not to do it. Yeah. I very specifically and clearly said, do not do this. Yeah. And, and then you did it anyway. Yeah. And, and, and he's like, I'm going to, I'm going to drop everything and run and just, you know, pray and you do the same. And of course, Fassbender's not at all prepared for this, right? Uh-uh. He hasn't, he, he, he didn't really realize the seriousness because he had this like bravado. Yeah, uh, which which mm-hmm. we saw several times. He just has this unwarranted confidence and and suaveness and 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 j- just like that scene is great because even in that scene you get th- you get the sense that Fassbender still hasn't realized the seriousness of the situation. Yeah, even what even what Brad Pitt certainly has, of course. Um, yeah, the, like the the he he takes his sweet ass time mm-hmm. uh, going and like I love when he calls Brad Pitt later and Brad Pitt's like at the airport and he's like, "Where are you? I'm still at home." Uh, oh <laughs> that's surprising uh-huh. <laughs> you should probably not be there at your uh-huh. home which i mean i guess obviously we we the, penelope cruz's fate is is awful she's in, you know heavily implied she's been involved in a snuff film similar to the way brad pitt told that story halfway through the movie mm-hmm. um and then of course the, the 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 final shot of the film is her headless body being dumped in a landfill which thanks cormac thanks for yeah for that um good good old upbeat cormac mccarthy endings for you yeah um but i i think it, it is interesting that the that it's seemingly I mean, maybe i'm just reading this wrong maybe the cartel is not going to let him live maybe the cartel is just fucking with him and then is going to kill him later but it seems like they know where he is they drop off this tape for him are they just gonna let him watch it and then come kill him i mean what was your read there um, I, I think they weren't going to kill him. I think they basically, it's almost like the, the cartel in the story is, is being depicted as just this maximally evil inhuman force. Yeah. We barely even see, we, we don't actually even ever really see them, right? Everyone we interact and talk to is like one, one place removed from the yeah. actual members of the cartel. Seems like it. Yeah. Um, and, and so in, in that light, it seems like it's actually more evil and horrible to mm-hmm. take the one thing for which he did all of this for and the only thing that he cares about and brutally murder her and then um, just leave him, you know, crippled, basically. Yeah, like uh, that's that's punishment enough for you that we took the, the one thing. Yeah. yeah. Spe- speaking of the um, that final shot, like that's exactly the kind of thing that makes this movie stick with you um Mm -hmm. because i was actually thinking you know he gets the um he gets the cd and and you know this i actually did like this about the movie like i I feel like i feel like a different movie makes it more explicit that like ah this is the snuff film cd but like he just he just gets it and then looked and then like that completely melts down and then you the you you the viewer are trusted with understanding like Mm -hmm. ah that is almost certainly the snuff film which which is now in his possession and then you have to ask, like, well, could you know what would you do if you had such a thing in your possession? Would you, would you, be able to just dispose of it and never actually know? Yeah, you know what I mean. And and it's and then I'm like, I wonder if we'll ever find out if she actually. And then they just cut to the <laughs> the, the the you know mutilated body tumbling out of a of a dumpster at you know yeah. at sunset or whatever. And it's like, uh <laughs> Yeah. Shit. <laughs> there goes that. Yeah, not subtle. Like, yeah. I mean, like the thing about Cormac McCarthy is actually I don't think he's very subtle at all. Like mm-hmm. there's nothing there's nothing about No Country for Old Men that's subtle, right? It, mm-hmm. It's the it's in the na- it's in the title. <laughs> this is No mm-hmm. Country for Old Men. Um it's the world has become some scary, terrifying, unrecognizable, horrible thing and we and the older generation has no idea what to do with it. It's all right there. This is not subtle either. And the, I, I agree with you. I think it is like this moment of uncertainty. And I, and I love the idea. I love the question of, is he going to watch this thing? Right? Because that's one of the things that Brad Pitt said when he was telling the story of the snuff films is that by, you know, the, the, the viewer is complicit in the murder, which of course he is, he is complicit in her murder. Like she's uh-huh. dead because of him. It's his fault. And, um, so I, I love I love that kind of unknown there. Um, yeah. I, I don't think I could ever press play on that thing, though. Jesus Christ. Yeah, well, that that's the thing is I, I don't think he would ever press play, but nor can he ever really just throw it away as he should. Yeah. Yep. And, and right. that and that's kind of the most horrible fate possible is never really knowing one way or the other, but never being able to release yourself from it. Yeah, no, um, I think you're right. Um, 
the thing about this, Matt, is is we're we're talking, and I think we're being really positive and kind of glowing <laughs> about you know what the movie is doing. I think the reality is of it, it is on top of this m- complicated layered theming. You do have these incredibly stilted performances uh, that are people just just really struggling through extremely purple dialogue that that doesn't sound like any human being would sound at all yeah. and and so like that the, when you just talk about the movie in the abstract it it becomes this b- brilliant great work of art and you kind of forget that the the being in the trenches of the movie is actually the hardest part of it um yeah. i i think this is really fascinating too because like the story of the movie is that ridley scott was trying to get a, a adaptation of Cormac McCarthy's Blood Meridian made for years. He was really trying to get this to happen and it kept falling through and it kept falling through. And then finally Cormac McCarthy came to him with a a screenplay that he wrote. Um, Not the first screenplay that he wrote, by the way, but the only one, the first and the only one that uh, got optioned. Um, And Ridley's like immediately like, yes. So like in the back of my mind, I have convinced myself that Ridley Scott said yes to this project without reading the script because he really wanted blood meridian he really wanted to work with cormac mccarthy this is something he really wanted to do in his career and he just said yes and then read it and it was like oh uh-huh. how are we gonna make this work yeah so yeah maybe he was even a little overly optimistic that he could make it work because mm-hmm. you know i've seen it i've seen the movie referred to as shakespearean which is interesting because i think when they say that what they mean is that it deals with these sort of um, totemic uh, uh, so archetypal occurrences yeah. of, of, of horror. But, but, it, but interestingly, you could also take it as like Shakespearean speech. It's like we watch a Shakespearean play and we just accept that the characters are speaking in iambic pentameter yeah, um, and it's not a big deal to us. So, you know, at some point while watching this movie, I'm not saying that I that the movie went down smooth for me, honestly, because it it didn't. While I was watching it, I was I was often confused by the plot and unintentionally amused by the dialogue. <laughs> but but I think at a certain point, I kind of flipped a switch in my brain where I was like, "This is just an alternate universe where people talk this way." Yeah. And then once you accept that, then you can just you can just listen to what to what's happening. Um, like the conversations between Javier Bardem and, and Brett and um, Fassbender, like like no no nobody would ever talk that way, nor would they talk about those things. Mm-hmm. But in this universe, they do. And if you just accept that, then it's like, oh, that's okay. Well, it's kind of interesting then. Um, yeah, yeah, I, I I agree, and I think that's why you know when I was talking earlier that you know after the first forty five minutes or so, I I suddenly kind of started falling finding myself falling in love with this. And I think Mm -hmm. it's for that exact reason. I think it's because I was allowed uh, to, to transport myself to the universe in which this is how people have conversations. And this is the, this is the thing that movies operating in. And I think, you know, to give Ridley Scott all the credit in the world with this, I think he really achieves this sense of unmoredness in his direction. Um, One thing I read about this movie is the entire film was shot in Europe except for like a couple exterior pickup shots that don't have any of our actors in it, which is really interesting because this is a, this is a very American film. Um, most of it takes place in America mm-hmm. and yet it shot in Europe. And, and I think what that does is you see sequences like the one I'm thinking about right now is when um, they're, they're chasing after Javier Bardem, he's in his car and they have this, this quick um, driving through streets and roads. And you're like, where are we right now? Like he's, he's a club owner and his club seems to be in the middle of fucking nowhere with just like these random roads going to nowhere around them. And it just like, you get this real sense of like, we're not in a real place right now. And, and I think, choosing to film in Europe really adds to that feeling because there's no like recognizable Americana in any of this stuff here. Yeah. It's this Dolly painting fantasy land of, of, mm-hmm. of America. I mean, it's, it's interesting because no country, um, has a s- similar in some ways tone where mm-hmm. it's basically, I mean, no country for old men, the film, not, yeah. Um, it, it, it gives this, this feeling that like 
basically the the Texas Mexico border is this hell dimension where people are just getting <laughs> murdered all the time and you can't walk around the block without witnessing a shooting and and there's just these assassins roving around and just just living there and, and having a little convenience store is basically a, a huge risk um because this is just a a lawless place this is you know and, and i think that mm-hmm. mccarthy has themes about the frontier and and so forth throughout all of his stories and, and also and very much about just like the innate hor- horror and evil of, of humankind um yeah and so it, it is this kind of elevated uh uh, uh horror almost um and and Mm -hmm. otherworldliness as you're pointing out i do think i I agree with you like nothing about javier bardem's existence like makes rational sense (laughs) and that's and that's it you know it's one of those things where um i i that's exactly the kind of thing that makes me think like yeah most people aren't gonna like this movie i didn't enjoy it for the most part while watching it and yet um if you if you see that as an intentional choice for the sake of atmosphere which i think is definitely something that really scott would do mm-hmm. um then it's then it becomes cool actually yeah, yeah. I, I do wonder so so you know it's funny we've we've said a couple times as we've gotten further and further into really scott's filmography we've basically been like i don't really know what i'm learning about really scott he he's a tough nut to crack. And I think this is maybe the first time when I'm like, I actually think I do appreciate this movie more for having watched all these really Scott films. Mm-hmm. I think I think if I just watched this out of the blue with no real rumination on what Ridley Scott was trying to do as a director, I would just be like, what a piece of trash and move on. <laughs> um like that, you know, that was confusing and and weird and poorly uh-huh. done and the dialogue was bad and I'm so, some of the more uh, horrifying moments and scenes might have stuck with me, but I don't think we'd be having this complicated conversation about all these nuances. Sure. No, I, th- I think you're right there. I agree. I think this is one of those things. And the thing that's interesting to me is the constant refrain I think we've had throughout the course of this whole thing is uh, when Ridley has a bad script, uh oh, watch out because. Yeah. You know, when he has a good script, he's aces and the movie is a masterpiece. When he has a bad script, uh oh. And and that leads me to the question, like, is this is this a good script? I think the answer to that is no. <laughs> it's like it's not a good script. It's not a good movie. Like I want to be clear here. I don't I don't think this is a good movie. But yet Yet it is something. It is something really interesting, and I think the the innate what what makes Cormac McCarthy a a award winning writer when he's writing novels it it permeates itself into this film through, you know, McCarthy's work, but also through through Ridley Scott's understanding of the material. Something something beyond the words that were written on the page emanates from this thing that that allow it to to elevate it to the point where I'm like, this is a bad movie, but I kind of really love it. Mm hmm. Well, one thing that I love about it is it's just totally unflinchingly giving you the finger. And it's it's like, like, who is this for? Mm -hmm. Because even a movie like No Country for Old Men, which is in some ways very harsh, it still has Tommy Lee Jones walking away at the end. Mm -hmm. And it still has Anton Chigurh, who is a cool character. He's the villain, but he's cool. Well. And the thing about No Country is the central hook of it is easy and simple to understand and really captivating, right? Like yeah. this this guy found this money and he's trying to get away with stealing it. Yeah. And uh, and that that's it. so so we are kind of ushered through the extremely tense sequences in the film with this very easy to grab hold of and understand concept. Yeah, and and you can simply describe it to someone as a a drug deal gone wrong style thriller Mm -hmm. um very easy sales pitch which is exactly what this movie is on the surface but i feel like like that's why when you when you read the imdb plot summary i i laughed because like 
yeah, that's what the movie is Mm -hmm. like technically, but that's like not at all what this movie is about at all. Yeah. I'll, I'll I'll reread it for the benefit of, of, of everyone. A lawyer finds himself in over his head when he gets involved in drug trafficking. And now of course, when you hear that description, you immediately think if you haven't seen the movie, Oh, okay. So what's probably going to happen is this lawyer (laughs) is going to cleverly extricate himself from the mess that he's made. Yeah. And in fact, it's, the, the movie revels in its fatalism of just like yeah. w- once, once things go off the rails, you're just basically watching the train crash in slow motion and there's no reprieve. There's no silver lining. Nobody who you want to escape manages to escape mm-hmm. and the bad guys win. And yep. you're, you, you, be, I, I mean, I guess in a, in a sense, Cameron Diaz is almost a, a, a Anton Chigurh like figure. Sure. But, but not as sort of like like fun because <laughs> you know what I mean? I mean Sugar is 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 a fun evil character, you yeah. know, like like Hannibal Lecter or whatever. Sure. Like but Cameron Diaz is is not really I mean, she's kind of fun, honestly, but she's not fun in the same way. So she's fun in a very p- peculiar kind of way. I mean, I, I I very much enjoyed her scenes with Penelope Cruz, where it's just like she's just existing to make this woman as uncomfortable as possible uh, mm-hmm. at all times. I, I really I liked those scenes a lot, but yeah. yeah, it's it's a different kind of fun, and and it's also because like the, the way. <laughs> The movie is just so unclear about like, like there's times when she's talking on the phone to people and the movie just doesn't tell you who she's talking to. Mm-hmm. And so you're like, what? <laughs> like, <laughs> it's kind of revealed that she's like, she hired the two people that, that steal the truck, right? That go through this really complicated uh, and and enthralling sequence where they, they put the cord across the, the road and, and then shine the light to make him, you know, get out of his crouch over his bike to perfectly show. it's a that's a good sequence like the way that plays out very satisfying yeah. and and horrifying yeah um it's horrible yeah but like so you understand that like those guys work for her but you're like you're kind of left in the dark as like is she working for someone else is is javier bardem in on this too like she's having a conversation like the, the conversation i'm thinking about is when she's talking to someone and she said I am very much not out where she's just like, so I called the sheriff and I said, did you find any bodies along the road? And he said, yes, we did. And so I hung up and it's like, who are you talking to in this moment? Like, like who, who is that? And the movie never tells us. And so again, with the clarity, the clarity of Anton Chigurh is the thing that allows you to latch hold of him, even as he's awful. Um, the, the, the lack of clarity here is certainly by design, but I think you're right. Makes it, a harder movie to like. Yeah. No, I agree. I, I was very confused about what was happening and why at various mm-hmm. times th- to the point that I felt like I was dumb. Like, <laughs> like, like yeah, that, it happens sometimes when you're, when you're watching a movie and you're like, what is going on? Like, mm-hmm. am I, did I, did I like stop paying attention or, or something? It's like, no, I don't, I, I didn't. I was paying attention the whole time. I, I feel like I missed something though. Mm-hmm. Um, and that, and that's, you know, I think it's fair to hold it, hold that against the movie because it's yeah, it's kind of overly complicated. So like they never really explain the idea that there's this like device that allows the truck to run that is then in the motorcycle helmet. Like you're mm-hmm. you're really having to stretch to put these elements together. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Well, and and a lot of times one of the things I noticed on my rewatch is the dialogue that does explain the plot details is like buried in these purple conversations. Mm -hmm. And so like, you'll be, you'll be having someone like Brad Pitt, like waxing philosophically about like the nature of existence and, and, and what, what, how you derive meaning from your life. And then like, there's like one throwaway line in there. That's like, okay, you'll get, here's what your return on investment will be. Like, and it's like buried, Uh it's like buried in there. And so like, it's not even that you stop paying attention. It's just like, you're, you're processing the complex thematic depth of what these people are talking about and what what the true meaning under what they're talking about is and you might you might miss the the lines that are in there that are just like and this is how much you're going to give and you're going to do this and like like just even the fact that fastbender is going to be going into business with javier bardem to run a club like they're opening a new club and he's going to be involved in it it's like what 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 is that 
I, I almost missed that the first time because it's just a thing that they say yeah. at some point. It, it's just what they plan to do with their money to mm-hmm. sort of explain why they have money suddenly. Yep. Um, but but why? You know. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's in, like so much of the. Um, there's a scene with with John Leguizamo and um, uh, Asak Hank Schrader. Um, yeah. <laughs> in, in this movie for, for, uh, for Breaking Bad. What Breaking is that guy? Bad. What is that guy? I yeah, can't remember. I, that I actually. should know his name because he's yeah. the, he's the guy. Um, but uh, uh, that's Lee Norris. This th- th- that's a fascinating scene because, like, yet again, it's like, why is this in this movie? But also, mm-hmm. um, what it is is it's yet more of this. Like, we're following the truck, mm-hmm. and it f- and it gives it this feeling of of like the the movement of the drugs into the country is just this inexorable force of nature, like whales migrating or something. That, that, yeah, and, and, and there's nothing you can do to change or or alter it. Um, nothing that Fassbender or anyone else could have done would have, would have had any impact on anything. And yeah, it, yeah it's just, it, you're right because it is remarkable how quickly they get back their truck, right? Uh-huh. They just, they just immediately find the truck and the people who stole it, eliminate them, get it back and just carry on with their business. And I think one thing I like about it in that is I think the way D Norris and John Leguizamo are talking is almost different from the purple prose of our other characters. Mm -hmm. And the thing that that, if I had to guess what that means is we have these people that are in the drug trade that they're Javier Bardem's or Brad Pitt's or or Fassbender's. And we're using all the actors name, by the way, because none of these characters, I I guess they technically do have names, but they all have first names only except for Fassbender who doesn't have a name at all is just the counselor. Um, so that's, that's why we're doing this by the way. Yeah. But, um, so they, they they like wax philosophically about the implications of this and the, the Faustian bargain of what they're doing and what they're not doing. And then in the actual movements of it, you have these two guys on the ground that are just like, hey, if electronic money moves across a dateline, does that get a day's interest or not? And that's what they're talking about, right? Like these guys are are moving drugs and a corpse and they're just so mundane and casual about it. Like th- this isn't some big, like, you know, wild west, like, um, type system that's going on here. It's just this mundane evil. That's it. Um, you just have guys that are horrible and traffic and drugs and kill people and shove, shove them inside a barrel that just rides around in the back of a sewage truck. Why? Because we don't care because we wanted yeah. to get rid of them. And we think it's funny that just like we're going to try to sell this truck later and there's going to be a barrel with a corpse ins- like uh-huh. inside it that no one's going to know about. And it's fun. Yeah. And it's just like the difference in the reality of of what the thing is and the way Brad Pitt and like and uh, uh, Bardem and Fassbender talk about the thing, I think is really, really stark. Yeah, I like that. That's a good way of articulating the 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 feeling of it, where it's like they they really don't understand the sort of depth of of indifference and evil that they have mm-hmm. that they have uh, chained themselves to, um, and the, and the movie is taking the time to to point that out um, mm-hmm. and just uh, really emphasize the inhuman evil of of this uh, the system. Um, yeah. I it's it's so it's so interesting to talk about. It was such a baffling movie to actually experience, but not even baffling in a bad way. Like I'm actually right now I'm struggling with the idea of like would I recommend this movie? <laughs> and, and I think I think the thing that's holding me short of recommending it is is literally who would I recommend this to? Mm-hmm. I don't know that I would recommend this to like, I honestly can't think maybe I have some friends who are very sort of like artistic and would appreciate something kind of weird and and thorny. And I can, and I can be like, you should watch this film. It's very, it's very, it's a very unusual film and I think you'll enjoy it. Mm -hmm. But, but that's like one or two friends that I have out of all of the people that I know. Um, Most people I think would just, I, I would just be like, I don't think you'll like this. And I'm not even saying like, oh, you you won't get it. It's like, no, you just won't enjoy it. Yeah. And and uh, it's not worth it. <laughs> I, yeah, I, I mean, know. I think Do you we agree. Can, yeah, I think we can go back to our 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 mutual friend 
cinema decider, Michael, who <laughs> it, you're absolutely right. It's not that he would not get this movie. He would know exactly what this movie is doing. He would hate it. He would mm-hmm. absolutely hate it. He would say this is a complete waste of time. They do everything the worst possible way. Um, and I, I get nothing out of this. Yeah. I think that I think it is a valid criticism, basically what we said a minute ago, saying that like it didn't have to be this impenetrable and unenjoyable. You could have yeah. taken a version of this story, like just strip away everything else, just like this story. The story is very interesting. You mm-hmm. could have done a version of this story that made for a a much more watchable film. Yeah. Um, yeah, you could have. And and, and maybe that would have been the good call. Like there is part of me, the, the elitist film bro part of me that is like, I'm kind of glad that this is this weird on un- unpenetrable random fucking thing that is, is almost nothing like anything else that's out there. Like I kind of like that about it. Yeah. I, I, I feel you actually, like I don't actually think that all art needs to be the same and mm-hmm. conform to the same template for it to be good. Um, On the contrary. And, and you know, one critic made the point that it, it's very often the movies that at the time nobody understands that end up becoming, um, you know, the greatest film of the era 50 years later. Um, you know, th- there, there are many films that are now regarded as great classics of cinema that at the time went over like a lead balloon. And I'm not saying that that's what this movie is because I don't think it is a secret masterpiece, honestly. Mm-hmm. But what it has going for it is that it is willing to be so weird and different and break conventions uh, in ways that are shocking and upsetting and surprising. Um, and that, it, that at the very least gives it the chance of standing out. Yeah. Um, I and agree. Being, being something that actually sticks around. Yeah. And you want to know the weirdest part about this? This movie made money. (laughs) Yeah. This movie cost $25 million to make and it made 71 million. So like the, that was the people that decided to make this movie made money on it. And I wonder like this was 2013. So we're we're 10 years from now. I don't think this movie makes $71 million. Like it's got a big, a lot of big names in it. And that's why people went and saw it. But um, I just don't think, I don't think that happens anymore. It, it's really interesting because they, mu- I don't know how they, you know, it must've been like, Hey, we're going on vacation in Spain and we'll film a movie while we're there. Yeah. Um, but, uh, cause w- with all those names, it's surprising. They got the budget as low as 25 million. Um, yeah. Um, you're, you're so right. I, everyone must've worked at like scale. Like no one got paid money for this. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, Penelope Cruz was pregnant during the filming of this movie, which if mm. you know that fact while watching the movie, it becomes extremely obvious because they're, they're doing they're using a lot of the camera tricks that you see, like if you're watching a sitcom where the actor is pregnant and uh, not not so in the sitcom. Like there's there's a scene where the scene actually where she's kidnapped, um, where she's running through the airport and she's wearing like a trench coat and she's sprinting across the airport with a trench coat, which means both edges of the trench coat will be billowing behind her. Right. Uh-huh. And one of them is seemingly stuck in front of her perfectly to hide her, her, her bump. That's funny. <laughs> um, I had no idea. Yeah. Um, if if you ever go back and rewatch this, knowing that you'll see it everywhere because like they're constantly like, she just, we don't pan down. We don't pan down. She's yeah. always lying down or she's something in front of her, a table or a purse or something. Um, it's a lot of, a lot of very old, very effective tricks. Yeah. You know, it's just it's interesting to hear like that the movie did well enough to make money because I had just never heard of it. And, um, you know, I always kind of thought of myself as some kind of a Ridley Scott fan uh, on some level. So just never having really heard of it or known any, you know, if you six months ago, you know, even when we were doing this project, you could have asked me, what is the counselor about? And I would not have had a single word to say about it. Um, Mm -hmm. Just just no cultural uh, awareness of it whatsoever mm-hmm. uh, you, you said you saw it though so apparently that's not yeah but i don't remember when or why uh, honestly i i think it was one of those that hit hbo a year after it came out 
and mm. I saw it on one day and just watched it. Um, I don't remember like rushing out to the theater to see this movie, mm-hmm. but it, the, the thing, and I, and I honestly didn't remember much of it. <laughs> shockingly, the first time uh, I will, I will never forget this movie now, but the first time I saw it, don't remember much of it. I do. I, the, the, the cultural osmosis I had of this movie was uh, uh, like in my head, it was a weird, bad movie that a lot of people I follow on Twitter seem to really like is the thing that I had in <laughs> my head. And I definitely understand why now. Uh, after yeah. revisiting it that's interesting yeah so it's it's well regarded among um film critic weirdos i guess uh, yep. that, that kind of makes it, sense to me it definitely is you want to know another uh weird <laughs> a weird little factoid about this movie uh-huh. um cameron diaz in the movie is from barbados and when they filmed the movie she played her entire character with a very heavy accent of that region and uh it it did not test well uh-huh. um nobody nobody liked it i think i think bahan is the the technical name of the barbadian accent um it did not test well i, I wonder is it that the accident didn't test well or is it that the movie didn't test well but uh-huh. uh, one thing they decided to do is go back and redub every single one of her lines of dialogue with her just giving her her natural you know american american accent uh and she was pissed about it but she didn't market this film at all she like she she did not promote it at all because she was pissed about that but i think maybe that's part of the the camera diaz performance in particular feels very stilted to me and maybe that's part of it is that every line of dialogue you're reading there or hearing there rather is is 80 yard redone yeah um honestly her performance didn't bother me so it, it, i i did not um detect any of that Right. Like hmm. you, you would yeah. think that if a whole performance had been 80 yard, you would have a clue. But I, I did not notice that at all. Yeah. What did you think of her overall? Because this is kind of a very different kind of performance for Cameron Diaz. It's not the type of role she typically plays. And and it's funny if you look up some trivia on this, you'll see that Angelina Jolie had originally signed up to play this role and then backed out. And I was like, yes, this is 100 percent an Angelina Jolie role like it, that would it would not have surprised me at all to see her in that role yeah uh, it does surprise me to see Cameron Diaz in it but I think she does well you know I, I'll put this with the caveat that every every actor's performance feels a little bit a little bit wooden a little bit stilted but you know yeah. she holds her own with with some powerhouses of acting that she's put it next to yeah I, I was ready to roll my eyes because I was like she's she usually does light fair comedies mm-hmm you know, this seems really out of place and, and, and miscast. And it's, and she, I was impressed. I was actually like, oh, she's like actually embodying this character, this kind of ruthless, horrible Mm -hmm. person in a way that was surprising to me. Um, Like you said, I'm pulling up short of saying like, oh, she did great. It was amazing. Cause it's like the dialogue was it's impossible it's impossible to to do that well so (laughs) yeah it is i think impossible is the the best word for this yeah Yeah. all right anything else you wanted to say about ridley scott's the counselor i think i think i'm i'm happy with how this conversation went i think i i I wasn't actually trying to convince you it's good in fact (laughs) I, i i kind of knew it wasn't but uh i i really found a lot to a lot to enjoy in this thing yeah it was definitely interesting to think about probably more interesting to think about than it was to watch Um, I think that is a very fair assessment. Yeah. For sure. So that is Ridley Scott's uh, The Counselor. Um, From here, we will move on to... I'm trying to... God, I hate the new IMDb. It's fucking... Why is it so hard to find the director list, Matt? Why why did they change this website? Okay, here we go. The next movie, oh, is Exodus Gods and Kings. The, The Moses story is our next Ridley Scott film. Oh boy, oh boy. So that is going to be... I don't think it's going to quite be like this conversation. We'll say that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What, what, a, what a fascinatingly varied career this man has had. <laughs> oh, it's so true. Do, 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 do. Doof. All right, Matt. But before we wrap up the conversation for the week, uh, we, it's time for our newest sec- section. Uh, do you have the jingle ready? Did you make... Did you put that together? Uh is it, is it just the, no one knows what they're doing? Yep, there it is. There it is. So let's talk about movie theaters, and let's talk about Thanksgiving weekend, and let's talk about a couple movies uh, titled Glass Onion 
a Knives Out story and Strange World. So first, the first question I'm going to ask you, Matt, is do you know what Strange World is? Nope. I've seen one tweet referencing the fact that a movie called Strange World came out and was not advertised. Yeah. Now you have uh, children, uh-huh. uh, s- several of which would probably have been perfectly slotted in for this movie. Like, yeah. like the, the, the exact target audience we're looking at here. I, I, I should ask them if they've heard of it, actually. Maybe maybe it's been advertised to them via Roblox or something, but Yeah, but I the doubt weirdest it. thing is, like, they definitely did pay for marketing on this movie. Like, it's not like that it's just, like, Disney just woke up and said, no, nah, we're not going to push any marketing on this at all. Um, they definitely did that, but not in any of the right places. And this is this is a really interesting thing because you know, the other thing that happened while we were taking our unexpected break is that the CEO of Disney was uh unceremoniously fired. Bob Chapek lost his job. Bob Iger resumed the job that he had retired from, replaced him. And one of the big complaints that that that, that people had about Chapek and the job he did is the relegation of Disney animation to the Disney Plus uh platform right every single pixar movie in the last couple of years with the exception of uh, the buzz lightyear movie uh, was tossed unceremoniously on disney plus um i think the the other uh i think the the guy that directed this movie i believe also wrote uh maybe he didn't direct but he wrote raya um that which was that two years ago now i can't keep track matt raya and the last dragon it feels about right yeah, um, he he wrote that one, and that one got a theatrical release, I believe. Did it? God, I don't even remember anymore. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, it might not have because I don't think it did. Yeah, because that was pretty smack in the middle of COVID. Yeah. So this movie, uh, which which by the way, the people that did go see it largely think it was a a good, a good movie. Um, mm-hmm. it it didn't. No one went and saw it. It earned, uh, I think. I think at the, the box office, it earned eighteen and a half million dollars over the five day weekend, which is abysmal for a movie that reportedly cost one hundred and twenty million dollars to make, uh, not counting the budget. Of course, there, there's the, the analysts have said Disney's probably going to eat about two hundred million dollars over this thing when all is said and done, which is an astronomical amount of money. And it's like. You didn't market it and you, like you didn't do any like I shouldn't I should have heard about this movie and I didn't and yeah. I read trades and I spend an annoying amount of time on the Internet looking at movies and hearing about movies and I had never watched a trailer first. I had no idea what it was until the stories started coming out about how no one went and saw this movie we're, and it's like, yeah, we're having this conversation. I still have no idea what it's about. <laughs> Like I, I don't even have a, a single line of information about it, mm-hmm. and we've, we've had this conversation before about like, like I, you know, I have a YouTube subscription, so I don't get ads from YouTube, mm-hmm. and 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 where else, you know, where else would I hear about this movie? Because I don't watch TV with commercials on it. There's very few places that people can even advertise at me anymore, mm-hmm. and so. So what happens in a world like that where more and more people are kind of more like me where you have just opted out of all of the channels that are traditionally used for advertising films um and films are one thing where advertising really 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 matters um and it works right like it actually you know we all we kind of laugh off advertising often or at least at least I used to the, the idea of like yeah you've got to advertise Coca-Cola to me really mm-hmm. it's like well no like like advertising for films is like you're letting people know this exists and you're framing it to them in a way that's going to either make them say yeah that looks like that's for me and then what what am i going to do this friday night ah i'll go see that movie um like the 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 chain has been broken the the Mm -hmm. cycle the the machine has been broken um and this is just I, i you know this is a remarkably bad outcome like like spectacularly bad numbers you just said but to me it's like well that just seems like another another example of this process that we've been witnessing happening over the last two plus years. Yeah. This fascinating thing where there's not as much money in entertainment as everyone thought there were, you know, people were spending money with the assumption that there was going to be this infinite 
well of money. And the last couple of years have really showed investors, at least, that that's not true. And that's why all these companies are losing money. That's why Disney is freaking out and firing their CEO. Um, Disney lost a billion and a half dollars last quarter, last quarter, not the whole year, not year to date. But in in three months, their their streaming division lost a billion and a half dollars, which is so much fucking money. And I know Disney is a very, very big company, but that's a lot of fucking money. And nobody knows this is, I mean, this is, nobody knows what they're doing. Like, like you, you're just going to eat another 200 million on this thing. Cause you fucked it up. Uh, like I, I'm really interested to see what Iger does when he, when he steps into this thing, because I just don't know what he's going to do to turn this particular boat around, because it just seems like we're headed towards this. Like, you know, the counselor is a movie that even if it did get made, these days, as we said, it would not make seventy million. That's huge. Yeah. That's huge. Do you think movies have gotten worse? Just like generally, like the quality of film. I intentionally said that in a stupid way <laughs> to see if to see how you would react because because in one sense, of course they haven't. We still got all these. We still got amazing movies coming out all the time. But in 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 like a different sense. There's sort of, I just, I, I don't know, man. Like, I just remember being in my 20s and we would just go see movies all the time. Mm-hmm. It didn't even, you didn't even have to particularly convince me that it was going to be a great movie. I would, like, it was just a thing to do. It was a, it was a fun thing to go do. And I'm like, is that, is that gone? Is it, do people, See, look, I'm in a place in my life where I just can't do that anymore also. Uh-huh. So there's a confounding factor where it's it's very much likely that it's like, no, I, I, I am just over-conditioning on the fact that my life doesn't look like the life of a 23-year-old college student or whatever. Um, but it, it, it's you, you, just, you look at the movies that are coming out nowadays and you look at the movies that were coming out in the early 2000s or, or, or what have you. I'm just picking that, like you, you could you'd say the 80s, 90s, 2000s, whatever. You know, where's where where are the fun popcorn movies? I'm probably just talking out of my ass. I, I just don't I mean they're all Marvel it. movies now. That's like that that that's the Marvel has taken over the popcorn blockbuster film. Um, so th- I mean that that's that's interesting. There also seem to be no comedies anymore. Yeah, the the studio. I mean, honestly, man, the the answer here is it's all gone to t- to TV. Mm-hmm. Like. I guess to to answer your question broadly, no, I do not think movies are worse today than they were 20 years ago. I think I think one thing that happens is you're, you're in the dregs of watching a string of bad movies and you're remembering all the best movies from yesteryear, right? Like like hundreds of movies come out every year. The ones that you remember are typically the ones you absolutely love and the shitty ones you forget. And when you're in the middle of watching the shitty ones, you, you, it's harder to forget those. So I think a comparison to the past of film is always going to just elevate the best of the best of the best of those years. Like everyone rolls their eyes at Citizen Kane being one of the best movies of all time. And it's like, well, that was one movie in a year that <laughs> had like hundreds of fucking terrible pieces of shit. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's, that's how every year works. So I, I think movies are better than they've ever been broadly. Um, I do think that the, the best types of movies aren't getting made as much and and you have to do a lot more work as a, a a viewer to find those movies to chase those movies down and to get them in front of you where you know in the past you would just walk into a movie theater and they would just be there and it, it, you, you didn't have to do that work you didn't have to do that content curation that now we're kind of saddled with doing yeah that makes sense because I, I do feel like i used to literally just like show up to the theater and be like all right what are we gonna see Mm -hmm. which is which is a thing i literally can't imagine doing now yeah um i I, part of it is definitely your your lifestyle has pretty dramatically changed since then as well yeah yeah um the the other interesting thing about this conversation though is we have another side of this coin another side of this nobody knows what they're doing coin we have disney who 
horribly fucked up a theatrical release and is going to lose a bunch of money. And on the other side, we have Netflix with Glass Onion, the sequel to Knives Out. So a little bit of background here, Matt. Um, Knives Out came out. It was a smash hit. It was like so much money. They made so much money off that movie because it was created as this small little tiny movie and then blew up. And then Netflix walked up to to um, Ryan Johnson and said, here's three hundred million dollars. Please make two more of these movies for us. And Ryan Johnson said, OK, um, I have one stipulation, though. I need you to give me a theatrical release on these movies. I love theaters. I love going to the theater and I want my movie to be played in theaters. And so Netflix said, OK, fine. And they dropped Glass Onion, the Knives Out sequel in theaters over Thanksgiving for six days. It went to about 600 theaters as opposed to the 4,000 that that wide release movies usually do. And it was there for six days. And in those 600 theaters over six days, it made almost as much as the Strange World movie did. It made thirteen and a half million dollars, um, which is huge, which is like, you know, comparatively huge to the point where they they pulled the movie and the theaters are like screaming at Netflix. Like, what are you doing? bring the movie back. Let it stay in theaters longer. Look, obviously people want to see this movie and they're going to come see it in theaters. And the idea that it's going to be on Netflix later in December is not deterring them from going to the theater and seeing the movie. What are you doing? And Netflix said, yeah, we don't, we don't care. Uh Um, That's not, that's not what we care about. And it, it is fascinating to me that, that we're in this situation, you know, where Netflix is leaving millions of dollars on the table because they are absolutely convinced that it is better for their bottom line in the long term for this to be a Netflix exclusive thing. And I think, look, I'm not an industry expert. I just think they're wrong. I just don't think, I don't know. What do you think about this? Do you think yeah. in 2022, people are signing up for services that they had not planned on signing up for before because there's one thing on there they want to watch. No, I, I think, I think this is very stupid. I think, um, it's what's probably happening. What could be happening is you've, you've got a corporation where there's basically different, um, corporate interests in play. Like, like you've, you've got, complicated management structures and people with their own fiefdoms and um, their, their own incentives to, to maintain power in a certain way. And I think that, I think it's, I think Netflix is probably a really poorly managed company is Mm -hmm. the actual answer to to, to your question of of like, what's going on here. I I think, you know, some things you just said where you, where you said like they think it's going to benefit their their bottom line, but they're wrong. It's like, well, I, I think the subject in that sentence, the the they is in fact not an organized unit of, of smart people who, you know, you can imagine would just make really smart business decisions. I, th- I think there may be like a head of, 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 you know, content mm-hmm. who is responsible for making these movies. And, and then there over here, there's a head of um, increasing the, the, subscriber count or or something i'm sure there's yeah. a business title for that and like these different p- people have different incentives and and really none of their incentives is, are actually like do the thing that's going to make netflix the most money no matter what because like like obviously you're 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 obviously right that the right thing to do here is to release films like knives out too <laughs> well you know which is which else how everyone thinks about it mm-hmm. um, give it a wide release let it make hundreds of millions of dollars and then use that to fund your you know what, whatever projects netflix needs to be funded mm-hmm. but they're just um i i think that they're uh 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 at odds internally i don't know this i'm i'm actually just guessing but um, it seems to me that a lot of the dysfunction that we've observed in a lot of these big tech companies, you can vaguely call Netflix a, a tech company, a lot of these big companies in the last, in the last many years has basically been um, 
people found new sources of revenue, which enabled them to have infinite money printer companies. And there were no longer any incentives to run the companies well because mm -hmm. interest rates were low. You could get free capital from entrepreneur, uh, from, um, from lending entities of, of different kinds. And there was no, you, you never had to pay the piper. So you could just do stupid things and, and, and put stupid people in charge of massive business units. Yeah. Um, and I think that is now the world we're living in where I actually think the house of cards has started to topple. I think when you raise the interest rates and capital is no longer free, suddenly there are consequences when your movie <laughs> makes $13 million. Suddenly that actually matters. And it isn't just like, you know, oh, bad luck. Uh, well, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll sort it out next quarter. Uh, cause there might not be a next quarter. Yeah. And the, the general idea that at least from the investors perspective, the stock market, that as long as you show subscriber growth, it doesn't matter what your actual numbers are. The only number that wall street cared about for years and years was that subscriber number. And as long as that was going up, then they saw growth potential and the stock went up and that is no longer the case anymore. And it's, yeah. you know, and it's, there's this, this general oversaturation thing that's going to happen, right? Where, you, if you want growth and revenue, eventually you're going to have to find a, a new method outside of subscriber count because eventually you're going to get to the total number of subscribers you have. You have to find a way to get more money from the subscribers you have. The the standard Netflix play at this point has been, oh, we'll just raise the price of subscriptions, which is what they've been doing. But that's that's the beautiful thing of ad driven media actually and why ad driven media was the predominant force of media for for basically since its inception right because if if more people if everyone that has a netflix subscription watches your newest netflix show netflix doesn't get any more money from that right than if they hadn't watched it yeah. but if you have an ad driven model then suddenly that space becomes worth more money and suddenly you can charge more money for that. And that's that's what we're seeing, right? We're seeing that shift where Netflix now has an ad-based tier. Um, all these other companies are going to do something similar and that's what we're moving to because we're out of the growth phase of subscription modeling. It doesn't yeah. it doesn't provide money anymore. No, and, and you know, I think it was always this sort of promise that like, yeah, 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 okay, we weren't profitable this quarter, but look at our numbers. Like all we'd mm -hmm. have to, we we just have to figure out some way of monetizing these these eyeballs. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, it, it's it's interesting because it's not even just, you know, it's definitely not just the streaming services. You know, Facebook, Meta. Yeah. Um, Twitter, their, yeah. F Facebook's user base has grown consistently forever. Mm-hmm. There's more Facebook users than there have ever been. But their stock price is now crashed to the level it was in 2016. Um, because I think the f it, it's not that the faith in like their ability to gain users is broken. It's their faith in the in the whole idea, the whole business model, basically. Mm -hmm. the, the idea that like, oh, you're just going to get all the users and then dot, dot, dot. We make we, we make bank and the thing and like Facebook is profitable. It's just mm -hmm. you can't justify this valuation sure. on that level of profit. And, and I think the same is true for Netflix where it's like, well, I, actually, I don't even know if Netflix is profitable or not. Um, no. <laughs> but but I don't think, you know, I think that the, what has been lost is the faith that like, well, we just we're just going to put in money now and then like, you know, someday it'll pay off. Yeah. It's like how how exactly is it going to pay off? I don't I don't see it happening. Yeah. Which is why it's so outrageous to me that they're leaving money on the table when it comes to stuff like Glass Onion. I just don't understand. Like I, I could like you make the argument even with a movie like Strange World, you know, which is which is a Disney animated feature that has the the backing of the one of the most beloved animation studios in the world. And, and so like, you've got the strength of that, but it's still a new story with no recognizable names or in it. Right. The glass onion is the sequel to a movie that everybody loved. <laughs> Yeah. Everybody loved this movie. Everybody that saw this movie, it, it overperformed like crazy. And even that, like the, like the risk there is almost nil. You put this, you give this thing a wide release, it's going to make money. It's going to do it, guaranteed. I, I, I don't get it. I don't get it. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think it, it is funny because I think our, you and I, 
we've always had this attitude of like there must just be a, a eight dimensional chess game going on that we just don't <laughs> understand and because they just keep doubling down on these decisions that seem mm -hmm. baffling to us and we've we even tried to concoct like well maybe it's like this is the plan and it's like no i think that i think it's just they don't know what they're doing it's really simple they don't mm -hmm. know what they're doing people are handing them money they're saying well we got to spend this and hope that that spending results in future cash flows somehow yeah um and then that just went on for a really long time mm -hmm. and now we're here yep and now we are here <laughs> all right uh that's all i had on that particular topic but that was uh it's we'll, we'll probably come back to nobody knows what they're doing matt because because hey turns out nobody knows what they're doing yeah that'll be fun Doodle -doodle 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 Okay, uh, as the last thing we wanted to talk about this week, I just wanted to get your feeling on the Indiana Jones 5 trailer that just dropped, you know, I think a, a couple of hours before we started recording. It appeared on the internet. Um, what, what did you think of this trailer? What, what, are you excited for this movie? What are you thinking? Oh, I'm, I'm pretty um, not excited about new Indiana Jones movies. <laughs> um, you know, the Crystal Skull was pretty, pretty disappointing. Um, yeah. And Harrison Ford is is quite advanced in age and the trailer is is definitely playing all of the nostalgia notes i mean it really actually kind of reminded me of the force awakens first trailers where <laughs> where it's very clear that they're just playing your your nostalgia like a harp they're, they're they're really going for some imagery that is ripped straight out of the original films mm -hmm. um but not necessarily in a way that's going to make you know anybody actually feel satisfied. Sure. Like they, you know what I'm talking about? There's like specific images in that trailer where you're like, "Ah, oh, that's the thing." Yeah, no, you I, know? I, I have to say this this movie trailer has kind of confounded me, and, and mm -hmm. partially because I have almost intentionally read very little about what this movie is. Obviously the big, the big thing in this trailer is we see a de-aged Harrison Ford, which I'm still just not in love with this technology, Matt, like even in the brief moments in trailers, it, it has a sheen to it that is just still a little bit uncanny Valley for me. I will say like, at least this isn't a, a person that has died that we're digitally recreating. This is just reducing Harrison Ford's age, but I'm very unclear of when this movie is supposed to take place. Like, is this going to be a primarily de-aged younger Harrison Ford as Indiana Jones movie? Or are the are these just flashback sequences that are gonna make a small subset of what this entire movie is? And the trailer tells me nothing in that regard. And maybe that's intentionally the point. Maybe they're intentionally trying to obfuscate that to get people to go see the movie. I I I'm just left very, very confused. I don't know. I think it's gonna be a magical time travel movie honestly <laughs> really that yeah actually i i, I yes Interesting. um i don't think they're flashbacks but um it does say the dial of destiny so maybe that's like a they talk about sun, magic sundial there's there's ma there's there's a voiceover that's about magic we see young harrison ford and we see old harrison ford yeah i i don't know i don't i don't really care because I mean, I, I don't know who's in charge of this one. All I know is I was so disappointed in the previous one that I, I'm just I'm my expectations for modern day Indiana Jones movies are are non existent. So let me give you a little hope. Uh the person at the helm of this one is James Mangold, who has directed uh Logan, um, Ford versus Ferrari, um, three ten to Yuma, Walk the Line. Like he's got he's got a pretty pretty good background here hmm. so uh, maybe that will give you some more encouragement that this movie is possibly in good hands i i am tentatively excited i like indiana jones except for that one time when i watched temple of doom and and it was it was real bad it was a real bad movie uh -huh. um uh it as phoebe waller bridge in it as i guess the movie the trailer says uh Indiana Jones is playing her father-in-law. Sure, whatever. Um, does that mean she's married to Shia LaBeouf? Are we st is Shia LaBeouf in this movie? I there's don't know. No, there's no Shia LaBeouf in the trailer. So, yeah, that's uh, true. So that's suggestive. Um. So yeah, I I don't I don't know. I I don't 
I wasn't happy when I heard this was announced that they were going to go forward with this. I, I still, if it's, if it's a lot of this de-aging stuff that I just don't like, I'm not going to be happy, but here, here's what I am tentatively excited about this. I do think it was a, it was a well put together trailer. I think you're absolutely right that they're, they're playing certain chords and, uh, and I think it, I think it generally works. Um, you think, you think the trailer generally works? Yes. Like I'm, I'm not yes. saying it's like a garbage trailer. I'm just like, I, you, I don't know. I don't even know how you would make me excited about this because I'm so jaded now. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's a fine trailer as far as trailers mm-hmm. go. Yeah. Sure. Remember the part where he, wh- he takes out his whip and whips everyone and they just pull out guns. Cause yeah, it's, Sure. It's acknowledging but, that a whip is an absurd weapon for a person yeah, to be well, carrying around. Well, and it's also calling back to the to the mirror scene where the guy pulls out the swords and then Jones pulls out the gun, mm-hmm. right? So, but like sure. the, the 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 trailer is full of callback stuff. It's entirely it's so much callback stuff. So many callbacks. <laughs> and at this at this point of the like remake reboot cycle, I'm just like, okay. I feel nothing. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I know this is. I know I'm being very stick in the mud right now, but I really no, no. You're good. You're yeah. good. Um, I will say, like the internet seems to have reacted extremely positively to this thing, where they're like, oh. "Holy shit, that trailer!" And I liked it. I I'm not quite. I, I'm a little confused as to why we were like that gung ho about it, but but whatever. Uh, I certainly am confused. When you showed it to me, I was. I would have expected that people would be rolling their eyes and, and making Force Awakens trailer comparisons. Yeah, again, anecdotal. I'm just commenting on what I'm seeing, yeah. but okay, uh, I haven't I haven't cool. done any official d- data or anything. That's, but that's fine. People, uh, it makes me happy when people are happy, even if yeah, I yeah, definitely don't feel definitely. the same. Yeah. All right, so we will find out if that movie is any good when it comes out in June of next year. It's probably going to be great, and I'm going to look back on this and feel like a heel, but. That's fine. That's how it goes. That's the that wheel. is fine. It's the wheel of of life. It is. Speaking of wheels, it's time for this one to stop turning. I didn't think uh-huh. this metaphor through. Uh, that's all we have for you folks this week. If you have any opinions on the counselor on Strange World or Glass Onion or the mess that is the streaming industry, uh, you can reach out to us via email at doofmedia at gmail dot com or over on our Twitter at doofmedia. Yeah, and if you're not already subscribed to this podcast, we encourage you to do so and ensure you never miss an episode. You can find us on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, YouTube, Google Play, and pretty much anywhere else podcasts can be found. And if you like what we do here and want to support us, please consider becoming a patron of Doof Media. Head on over to patreon.com slash doofmedia and pledge at any of the available levels for a whole bunch of neat bonus things, bonus episodes. I think... uh, um, we have a, a World Cup bonus series going on right now uh, where a, cu- a couple of our partners are uh, talking about the World Cup from the perspective of Americans who know nothing about soccer. So if that sounds fun <laughs> to you, you can subscribe now and listen to that. Uh, awesome. Awesome. Also, please consider rating and reviewing the Doofcast on Apple Podcasts. Every review helps us get more exposure and introduces new people to the content that we make here. All right, folks, that's going to do it for this week. Next week, we're doing it, Matt. We're doing Andor. We're a whole Andor episode next week. I literally can't wait. Me neither. I'm so excited about this. Just make sure you watch the entire series over again before uh, before Thursday. No okay? problem. <laughs> we'll see you all next week. And you'll do what I say. My name is Doof, and you'll do what I say.